So this is a really, really fun time uh, for those of us working in the area of privacy and security and surveillance. Uh, typically, when you work on privacy issues, you get steamrolled. And the reason for that is uh, it's often portrayed as an issue of privacy versus public safety. Right? The technologies that can, that can keep you safe online and keep the government from knowing where you are and stop online advertising companies from tracking you, it is said can assist pedophiles and terrorists and drug dealers. And so oftentimes we're fighting against uh, a, a very difficult opponent uh, and um, bills that would make our lives a lot, di a lot more difficult are, are labeled like the Protecting Children from Internet Pornographers Act, uh, th things like this. In the last couple of years, cybersecurity has sort of come out of nowhere in Washington. Everyone is scared, everyone is worried, and, and, and needs to be seen to be doing something. Uh, but there aren't a lot of original ideas. There isn't actually a lot of, uh, of smart thinking in DC. And so policymakers have latched onto things like information sharing and uh, liability for internet companies and haven't really looked at low hanging fruit that can both protect our security without uh, having any impact on civil liberties, or if, if anything, actually protecting civil liberties. And so today I want to talk about one really interesting thing that we can all work on that, uh, it, that will likely help people in many, many areas. I know there are people here who are worried about subsidization of phones, who are worried about freedom to, to use different devices on networks. And I want, to, I want to emphasize that there are security issues that you can use. You can use the cybersecurity trump card to your benefit. So I want to tell you a story briefly about power. This is not a technical story. This is a story about power and power that a particular industry has over everyone else. So before we all had smartphones uh, and we were using these dumb feature phones, one of the coolest ways that you could differentiate your phone from your friends was through a custom ringtone. Right? And, and at, at peak, ringtones were a big business. The telephone companies either wanted to sell them or wanted to get a cut of the revenue. And so there are, there are several big companies and websites that were selling ringtones at 99 cents a pop. And the carriers wanted to make sure that people were not sideloading songs onto their phones. They wanted to make sure that if you set a custom ringtone on your phone, you purchased it through a store and they got a cut of the revenue. So the first Bluetooth phone that Verizon ever sold disabled Bluetooth file transfers between the phone and any other devices. So Bluetooth is a, is a, general, um, a general technology. It's not just for about wireless headsets. You can do many, many things. And one of the, one of the methods contained within Bluetooth uh, is the ability to do file transfers. Verizon disabled this because they didn't want people transferring MP3s from their computer to their phone to have custom ringtones. The Bluetooth file transfer feature in this device was a threat to Verizon's business model. Now, I'm sure many of you at one point or another have tethered your laptop to your phone. The wireless carriers do not like tethering, or at least tethering without a, an additional hotspot plan. The reason for this is that the carriers would like to sell you uh, a, a separate service. They'd like to charge you $40 or $50 a month. Now, the mobile operating systems, both iOS and Android, include tethering cap capabilities in the OS. At one point or another, all of the carriers in the United States have blocked the tethering capabilities in the operating systems of the smartphones that they sell, uh, and they've also blocked access to third-party tethering apps. Tethering, again, is a threat to their business model, and the way they deal with this is by taking away the capability for consumers to tether in the phones that they sell to consumers. The third technology, near-field communication payments. Many modern smartphones include NFC chips in the phones, which can be used to pay for things at drugstores, at McDonald's, at CVS, what have you. Google was the first company to really launch an NFC payment system called Google Wallet. And although the NFC chip was present in, in many recent um, Google phones, three of the four carriers, everyone but Sprint, uh, has blocked access to Google Wallet uh, on, on their Nexus devices. And the reason for this is that the other three carriers are partnering with Visa and MasterCard for a, a differing payment system called ISIS. And uh, there are concerns that they didn't want Google Wallet to, to get traction in the market. And so, again, where technologies get in the way of their business model, the carriers have blocked the delivery of these features to consumers. Some of you have an iPhone. Many of you have an iPhone. One of the, things that you, one of the easy ways of figuring out who has power in a relationship is the look and feel of the device. So if you have an iPhone, I suggest you take it out at some point and look and see if you can see the logo of your wireless carrier. You can, look, you can look hard, you will not find a Verizon or AT&T logo anywhere on the iPhone. You won't find the logo outside the iPhone and you won't find the logo inside the iPhone. 
Apple, because of the power they have in the market, dictates the, the software that goes in the device and all of the hardware that, is, that, that, that the device has. The carriers do not have power in that relationship. Google doesn't have the power that, that Apple does. And in fact, when Google introduced the Android, Android operating system, the way they structured things was that they would give the operating system away to their hardware partners, the Samsungs, the HTCs, the Motorola's. And then those companies would in turn make phones and sell them to the carriers. And the carriers buy Motorola phones or HTC phones a million at a time. And when you buy a million of something, you get to dictate the features in the device. You can say that it's going to have rounded corners or square corners. You can say it's not going to have tethering. It's that certain apps aren't going to get access to certain APIs. You can preload apps. You can do whatever you want when you buy a million phones. And so what this means then is the carriers have all of the control all of the power over the Android ecosystem. And you can see this playing out. So this is, a, this is just one of many Android phones, and you can see that Sprint's logo is silkscreened uh, on it. The, the, the Google phone that I have in my pocket has my carrier's logo. I suspect if many of you have an Android phone in your pockets, you'll probably have um, the carrier's logo on it, unless it is a Nexus device, because the Nexus devices are the only Android phones that Google controls. It's not just about the silk screening logo, though. So it, I'm a Sprint customer, and so the NASCAR app is pre-installed on my phone. Um, I'm not a NASCAR fan, and not only is it pre-installed on my phone, but I cannot remove it. There is no way to get rid of the carrier pre-installed um, software. And this is because the carriers see the devices as their devices. They want to have control over these devices. Even though they are in our pockets, they are sold to us by the carriers, so the carriers decide what runs on the hardware. The problem is, is that because the carriers control the phone, they also control the updates. There is no way for the carriers to control which pieces of functionality are enabled or disabled in the phones without the carriers ultimately controlling the operating system and also ultimately controlling the operating system updates. If you are an iOS user, iPad, iPhone, I, uh, iPod, um, you get updates directly from Apple, no matter where you buy the device and no matter which network you're using. If you have a Windows computer, no matter where, whether you buy it from Amazon or Best Buy, um, no matter who makes the Windows computer, you get updates directly from Microsoft. And in fact, Microsoft even gives security updates to people using um, illicit versions of Windows. If you have a pirated copy of Windows, Microsoft still gives you updates because it, because it is in the best interest of the community for everyone to be running up-to-date secure software. That is not the case on, in the Android operating system ecosystem. There, the carrier has to give you updates. Everyone gets updates from their carriers if and when they make them available to consumers. So Ars Technica, the technology news site, did a great survey in December of 2012, uh, analyzing the Android phones that had been made available on the US market by US carriers. And they showed that typically consumers were waiting between six to 12 months for the first update after the device was introduced on the US market. In some cases, so this is a, a, a chart of LG, one of the Android device manufacturers, showing the first and second update. First is orange, green is the second update. You can see no green, which means none of these devices ever received a second update. And consumers are waiting between 9, 14, 15 months after the device first came out before they got an update. Samsung, the largest Android device manufacturer in the world, consumers here are waiting three, five, nine, eight months between when the device comes out and when they get their first update. And then in some cases, consumers are lucky enough to get a second update after 12, 13, 11 months. Contrast this to the Windows world where consumers get updates every month, Patch Tuesday, or more frequently if there's, a security, if there's an important security issue. Contrast this to Google Chrome or Mozilla Firefox where updates are pushed out every six weeks or more frequently if there's a security issue. In the Android ecosystem, updates are simply not happening. This is a chart from Google's website. I don't know if you can see it, but if you Google for the Google Android Developer Dashboard, you can see the latest stats yourself. They update them every two weeks. Google's stats show that the latest version of Jelly Bean, the, their, their Android Jelly Bean release, which is 4.2, is running on only 1.2% of devices. Whereas Gingerbread, which was released two years ago, is running on 47% of devices. Most Android devices are running software that is months or years old. And this is not just about consumers not getting the latest bells and whistles or not getting the latest app. This is a, these are 
operating system updates. These are security updates that consumers are not getting. This is a cyber security issue. Uh, a survey by, by a security company called Duo Security that was released in September or October of last year found that 50% of the 20,000 Android devices they, they, they surveyed were running out-of-date software with, with vulnerabilities that were known, that Google had fixed, but where the fixes hadn't reached consumers. The carriers are leaving consumers exposed to security vulnerabilities that Google has fixed. The updated version of the source code is available on Google's website, but the patches haven't reached consumers. This is the CEO of, of Duo Security uh, in September of last year. Yes, it's a scary number, but it exemplifies how important expedient patching is to mobile security and how poorly the industry, the carriers, the device manufacturers, etc., have performed thus far. So I live in Washington, D.C., uh, and I think that warps, uh, that anyone who lives in D.C. It sort of warps your mind. And so I think that the solution to this can only come from Washington. Um, the carriers and, in fact, the market have failed to deliver the kind of security that we expect from software companies. And, in fact, the reason is, is because the carriers don't really think like software companies yet. They want the power that goes along with controlling the software that people run on their devices, but they don't want the responsibility that goes along with it. Right? And we, if we've learned anything from Spider-Man, it's that with great power comes great responsibility. So about a week and a half ago, the Federal Trade Commission uh, announced a settlement with HTC, uh, an Android device manufacturer, over uh, pretty significant security flaws in, in HTC phones. In that case, HTC had added additional insecure software on top of the base Android ecosystem, or on top of the base Android operating system, and the, flaw, the software was so poorly written that it, it needlessly exposed consumers to security issues. There isn't anything in the FTC complaint that, that directly says that the companies, that, that HTC should be giving people updates. But the HTC, HTC settlement really is a shot across the bow of all of the handset vendors and the wireless carriers. Uh, and, you, and you see statements from the FTC's chief technologist, like Steve Bellavan, saying, bugs happen, ergo patches have to happen too. The carriers have a responsibility to give consumers updates or, at the very least, to tell consumers about the vulnerabilities that exist in the devices that they have sold consumers. Right? The carriers know which devices are vulnerable. Google has Google post patches every week, and the carriers are choosing to not give people updates. But fundamentally, I do think the solution to this problem is going to come from Washington, D.C. It has to, because the carriers, if left to their own devices, will not give consumers updates. National security. Right. So the national security is, in fact, the, the, the key issue here, particularly as mobile devices make their way into the corporate environment and into, the, into government through bring-your-own-device bring policies. Increasingly, it's not just people's personal information or sensitive photos or banking information that are on these devices, but it, they're sensitive documents relating to government and business organizations' work. We need to help people understand that the wireless carriers are now public enemy number one when it comes to cybersecurity. These companies have the ability to give consumers security updates. They're choosing not to. They are, they are leaving consumers vulnerable uh, on the devices that they have sold to them. They know that these devices are vulnerable, and they're not telling consumers. And I think it's time to hold them accountable. Thank you very much.